Thank you, Paul. Paul Neely, once again, our theme song provider. Hold on to your coat. Gotta love it. Thank you, Paul. It was good to, oh, it was good to hear your music. All right. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the uh, uh, couple minute uh, late joining in there. We were we were going to have a guest tonight, but uh, something has come up, and so she will be with us next week instead of this evening. So you just get me tonight. I hope uh, hope that doesn't ruin the evening for everyone. I, I know you were probably all excited about someone else, but uh, it's me. All right. Well, let's take a look and see what we got. Lisa says hello. I can tell the difference between my thought and an OCD thought. A regular thought or an OCD triggered thought, and yes, I just leave it alone and just don't act on it. Just do a compulsion I have done. So go away after one. It just gets stronger. More of a statement there than a question, but but we can talk about that notion of what's the difference between an OCD thought and a thought. Um, in some ways, maybe not much, right? Uh, the OCD thoughts some of you have, if I had the exact same thoughts, I would consider just thoughts, right? When when I'm at the top of the staircase and I think about throwing someone down the stairs, I don't say, well, that's an OCD thought to myself. I just say, oh, I thought about throwing someone down the stairs. That That's it. Um, to me, that's not an OCD thought. But to you, it might be, because that's the theme that your OCD has picked on of harm, right? So you might consider that an OCD thought. And wouldn't it be nice just to get to a point in your life where every thought was just a thought and you didn't have to be concerned about labeling it, is it, is it an OCD thought or not? Uh, because, again, there's plenty of people in the world who may have the exact same thoughts that you have and aren't bothered by them in any way whatsoever. And therefore, they don't consider them to be OCD thoughts the way that you consider them to be OCD thoughts. Now, there's a part of you that might say, well, I don't know that I want to live in a world where I'm not bothered by these thoughts or images or urges that I have. OK. As I was saying to someone yesterday, Every person who's ever written a horror film has been paid millions or more or less for their quote unquote awful, horrible, disgusting, gross, scary thoughts to be written down on paper and acted out by other people. And we celebrate them as wonderful authors. But then there's people with OCD who might have the exact same kind of things popping in their head who think, but I am a terrible monster because of these thoughts. And maybe the difference is with OCD, but what if I wanted to do that thing versus the person who wrote the movie just wrote it as a movie. They, they maybe didn't want to actually do it, but what if I want to do it? The reality is we all have thoughts. And I wonder if we waste time trying to label things as OCD thoughts or not, or if that even over time becomes a compulsion. Oh, well, that's an OCD thought. Okay. Can you approach it just like any other thought that you have? And if so, wonderful. Let's do that. That, that would be the goal, wouldn't it? That's where we would, we would want to go. Megan says, I have a new obsession. I'm hyper aware of everything and I'm afraid I'm going to go crazy and lose it all. I get myself so worked up, I go into a panic attack. How do I stop this? Any good ERP exposures? Uh, uh, Megan, how many times have you gone crazy and lost it all? I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm thinking you haven't because you very nicely typed that with good punctuation and all and proper spelling and no typos. So I'm assuming you haven't lost it. So um, Megan, uh, uh, just a very simple question. 
uh, tell me a time that your OCD actually told you the truth about you were going to go crazy and lose it. Just, just tell me one time, Megan, that that's happened. And if you can do that, then maybe I'll believe it's true. But, but I don't, I don't see any evidence so far of that being the case. Now, you get yourself so worked up, you go into a panic attack. I think we could, we could absolutely treat you for panic, and we could show you all the panic treatments that you you can do interoceptive exposures for panic, and those are exposure and response prevention exercises designed specifically for panic disorder. And what do we do in those situations? We purposely expose people to physical sensations that are uncomfortable. So we have people do things like running in place, hyperventilating, breathing through straws, spinning in chairs, shaking your head back and forth, holding your breath, learning that you can handle uncomfortable physiological sensations. And when one does that, one recognizes, oh, I don't need to be afraid of my body and I don't have to have a panic attack because I can recognize that these physiological sensations aren't actually dangerous to me. So, Megan, you might want to try somebody who does interoceptive exposure for panic to help you first and get you to realize even in those moments of feeling like you're going crazy, you don't have to have a panic attack. You might just sit there thinking you're going to go crazy, which I don't know anyone in the world who hasn't at some point in time thought that about something. So. Can sexual orientation OCD be pornography induced after watching a video that doesn't match one's sexuality? Um, well, it could introduce the, the concept of what if I was attracted to something that I don't think I'm attracted to. So that's, that's a possibility. Uh, can you have sexual orientation OCD without having all the symptoms? I guess I don't know what all the symptoms are, but can you? Yeah, that's, that's confusing to me. What are all the symptoms, right? What, what would we do? Um, Sorry, that jumped there. Let me go back to that. Can you develop OCD at 25 years old without having any prior OCD history? Sure, of course. People can develop OCD at any point in time. It might be rarer at certain times than other times, but it is a possibility. Would doing self ERP for sexual orientation OCD when not professionally diagnosed backfire in a way? Well, if not professionally diagnosed, how does one know that one has sexual orientation OCD? That would be one thing that I would want to ask about. And backfire, yes, because uh, many people who want to do their own ERP uh, throw themselves into the deep end of the pool instead of doing it gradually and slowly like we like to try to do it. Um, what's the difference between generalized anxiety and pure OCD? Uh, Generalized anxiety doesn't have compulsions. Pure OCD has mental compulsions. So that would be one way of differentiating the two of those things. Daily Art Grind, welcome back. Hi, can you tell us how to deal with relapses or spikes? Sure. Do your ERP. <laughs> that's the that's the best advice I can give you, right? <clears throat> if if it worked in the past, it'll work again in the future. And maybe the reason for the relapse or the spike is is a break from the thing that you were doing treatment-wise in order to be helpful to you. So we see this happen a lot where people start to feel better and they think, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing much better now. I don't need to do all that therapy stuff anymore. And maybe it's the therapy stuff that were keep, was keeping you better. So I like to tell people, do an ERP exercise every single day for the rest of your life. Just You might even get a group of index cards with all sorts of ideas for ERP written down on them. And then go ahead. Pick one every day and randomly do one. Just keep it in the forefront of your head that you do ERP all the time. And, and so you do it on a daily basis. Sometimes it doesn't feel like OCD anymore. And I feel the thoughts have become desensitized. Is that normal? However, at times I still obsess over the thoughts. Well, the whole goal would be desensitized to the thoughts, right? And to be recognizing them, again, as we talked about at the beginning, as thoughts. Thoughts. You've all heard the example, if you've listened here before, the example that I love to use all the time, which is at some point during this webinar, I may walk outside with a Molotov cocktail, throw it at my neighbor Dave's house across the street, setting it on fire. 
go to the middle of the street, drop my drawers, poop in a bag, light it on fire, put it in front of my neighbor Josh's house, ring the doorbell, he'll come outside, stomp it out because there's fire in front of it. But now he's got poopy fire all over him. And then on my way back home, I shoot three geese that are flying over my house because I got a pond in back. And then I come back in here and I finish the webinar. Now, um, I'm desensitized to that thought. Is that normal? Or am I a horrible, awful person because I've had that thought? I made that thought up, you know, probably months ago while I was doing this webinar. And so I continue to use it all the time. So I continuously have that thought. And I appear to be totally desensitized to it. Vanessa, is that normal? Or should I be appalled by it? Should I be disgusted by it? What do you think? Now, you say, Vanessa, however at times you still obsess over the thoughts. Sure. You have OCD. I can't necessarily stop you from obsessing over things for the rest of your life, but I can help you make sure you don't do compulsions anymore. That's really the goal. Right? You know, what does no OCD stand for? No compulsive disorder. Get those compulsions out of the way. So a reminder, welcome everyone to tonight's No CD webinar brought to you by No CD, No CD downloadable app. You can get at Google Play or iOS and you can reach out to us for teletherapy. We are now in the UK, Canada, Australia, and the United States. And we continue to get more and more insurance coverage all the time. So please reach out to us so that we can be there to assist you with all of your therapy needs. Uh, Rosa says, what brings on OVD, I'm going to assume you meant OCD, on at age 48? Uh, easy, a trigger. Right? Uh, if you look at it from the one way that we look at things, we talk about the diathesis stress model. All of us have certain predispositions towards certain things, but all of us might need the right stressor to kick those things off as well, too. So you may have a low predisposition for something, but have a huge trigger and get it. You may have a high predisposition towards something, but never have a trigger and never get it. And everything else might be somewhere in the middle. Okay. So that's what it would be. Flanoral fashion, LOL squad. That's quite a name. Uh, why was I able to recover from sexual orientation OCD episode in the past without ERP? Um, maybe you were doing ERP internally and you maybe you you had mostly mental compulsions and you decided to stop doing the mental compulsions on your own. And if that was the case, congratulations. Wonderful. Good work. Right. Glad to hear it. But I'm gonna bet you allowed yourself to learn that you can handle whatever the sexual orientation OCD thoughts or images or urges were, and you stopped doing compulsions to try to neutralize them. And when you did that, you learned that you could handle it. And when you learned that you could handle it, you started to feel better. So congratulations. It's a goal for everybody and what all of us therapists try to do for people as well too. Brandon said, tips on what to do when my harm OCD gives me a, what if you do and act on your thoughts? Oh, I'm sorry, what if you do act on your thoughts willingly? It seems so real and I don't know if it's OCD trying to get back into its control or due to my rumination. So let's let's parse that sentence out a little bit, Brandon, for a little while here. Number one, what if you do and act on your thoughts willingly? Or what if, I don't know why I keep saying and act. I'm maybe, I'm reading things that aren't there, everyone. Something's wrong. Uh, what if you do act on your thoughts willingly? Well, let's let's break that apart. And at first it starts with the what if statement. Now, if if there's a bigger waste of time statement than what if, I don't know what it would be, but um, I would contend that what if statements are the bane of my existence and the thing that OCD loves almost more than anything. What if you were to do that? What if you were to want to do that? What if you one day went and did that? And then you say another one of my favorite statements, which is, Brandon, but it feels so real. And what do I say every week about this one, everyone? It has to feel real. 
it's OCD. If it didn't feel real, it wouldn't be diagnosable and it wouldn't be a problem. And you come to therapy and say, Dr. McGrath, I've had this thought. I don't know if it's real or not. And I'd say, it's not. And you'd say, oh, okay, thanks. We're good. Everything's fine. But but that's not the way that it works, Brandon. It has to feel real. Why, why wouldn't it feel real? And how could it be diagnosable if it didn't feel real? So now you have a, what if you do something? And that in the OCD world of things goes to thought action fusion. And thought action fusion is thinking about something is as bad as doing something. So now I've committed an act just as bad as doing something by thinking about doing something. And now because those two are equal to each other and it feels so real, it feels as if I've actually done it. And now I'm wondering if it's OCD trying to control. Me. Well, yes. Because OCD wants one thing, which is do what I want you to do. And then everything will be fine. That's all OCD wants. Remember, Brandon, OCD doesn't give a crap about you. OCD doesn't care about your family. OCD doesn't care about your friends. OCD doesn't care if you lose your job or your housing situation or anything like that. OCD cares about one thing, and that thing is, please do compulsions to make me feel better. As long as you do compulsions and I feel better, everything's okay, and nothing else really matters. So, Brandon... If you want to get stuck in OCD, keep trying to figure out what if. Keep, keep trying to wonder why it feels so real. And keep doing all the compulsions that you can. That will keep you stuck in OCD forever. If you want to get out of OCD, Brandon, do the opposite of all those things. Recognize that a what if statement is a useless rabbit hole to go down. Recognize it has to feel real or else it wouldn't be diagnosable. And recognize that uh, control is an illusion. And OCD doesn't have to have control over you. Right? Just because you have obsessions doesn't mean that you have to do compulsions. And that's what we try to get across in therapy all the time. No compulsive disorder. Aaliyah says, pull that one up there. Can you talk about being toxic for your partner? because of your relationship OCD and breakups that might be the best in that situation. My R OCD caused me to blame her for my obsessions. I've hurt her so badly. Well, again, what have we said? Our OCD doesn't care about your partner. Our OCD doesn't care about your loved ones. Our OCD doesn't care about your friends. Our OCD only cares that you do compulsions to make it feel better. Our OCD is filled with what-if statements that are untrackable, unprovable, unattainable. And then our OCD punishes you for not achieving the unattainable thing that it wants you to achieve. So if you want to feel horrible for the rest of your life, do absolutely everything that our OCD wants you to do. And you'll be alone forever and you'll regret not ever finding the right person forever, but you'll also regret hurting all the people that you hurt because you broke up with them because you gave into your ROCD forever. And that's what will happen. That's, that's kind of how it will be if you let ROCD take over and run the show. Now you might say, but how can I be in a relationship if I have a thing going on in my head that's always causing me to doubt things? And the answer becomes, you learn how to recognize that and move on. Because just because it's there doesn't make it true or real. If you had a fear of punching people in the face, I wouldn't want you to stay inside for the rest of your life. I would want you to walk outside on a busy street and recognize that even though you had a fear of what if I were to punch people in the face, it doesn't make you punch people in the face. And you can apply that to anything that's going on, ROCD or, other, or otherwise. What if we don't love each other? Well, uh, maybe, maybe we don't. But hey, 
were together. And so far, things are, seem to be going well. Yeah, but they could be better. Yeah, maybe. But I'm going to take it as it comes and see see where it goes. But what if there's someone else out there for you? Well, there, there could very well be, actually. Well, shouldn't you go find them? Well, but then I could be giving up this thing that could be great as well, too. Well, isn't it worth the risk? I mean, OCD isn't going to stop throwing what ifs at you, right? OCD is just kind of like a pitching machine that's got an endless supply of what ifs to throw at you. What if this? What if that? What if, what if, what if hey, hey, oh, what if, oh, stop, dodge. <laughs> you know, there's... There's always more one if, one more what if than there is a logical answer that I'm going to be able to give you, right? So we can play the game, but your OCD is going to win every time because your OCD is always going to have one more what if to do than, than I can do, just the way that it goes, which is why, frankly, I've given up on, on attempting to even try to, to beat OCD in, in a discussion because it's, it's just a waste of time. I, I can't win an argument with OCD, nor will I try to win an argument with OCD as well. And the reason I'm not going to even try to win an argument with OCD is because I know that I'm not going to win an argument with OCD. OCD is going to win every time, right? It's it's just the way it goes, okay? So if I already know that, why would I waste my time trying to have a discussion with you about your OCD if I already know that I'm going to lose the argument? I can't convince you the way you want to be convinced that everything in your relationship is going to turn out great, that you're not going to harm someone, that you're not going to just simply lose control or go crazy, that you're not going to run somebody over with your car. That I, Name whatever your OCD is. There's no way, uh, even after 21 years of treating this disorder, there is no way that I am going to convince you that you aren't going to do the thing that OCD tells you, you might do. Now you have to make a decision. And the decision is this, is that acceptable to not have an answer to that question? OCD loves the all or nothing world because it's an easy decision. It's either yes or it's no. You either are going to do it or you are not going to do it. Now, let's break that apart for a moment. Because if I said to you, you know what, you are going to do it, your OCD would be like, see, I told you, I knew it, I knew it. There's confirmation, there's confirmation, I knew it. We knew it was coming. We knew this was gonna happen, now we have confirmation. And if I told you you're not gonna do it, you're gonna say, how do you know? Are you sure, really? Do you really know? I could have 100 people lined up, 99 who tell you, you aren't going to do blank. And one says, eh, maybe. You're going to go, see, look at all you other jackalopes over there. None of you told me the truth. This person is the only one who told me the truth that it could happen. And since it can't happen, it will happen. And since it will happen, I need to be locked up or hide away or something like that because I should never be around anybody else in the world just to protect them from the potential of me maybe doing this thing. It sounds like an awful way to live, doesn't it? I mean, and, and then everyone I've treated with OCD says, yeah, it is. It sucks, right? It, it totally sucks. So you might say, well, how do I get out of that? What do I do? You're not going to like the answer, but I'm going to tell it to you. But you're not going to like it. I'm just going to tell you right now. You're not going to like the answer. And the answer is this. You sit in doubt and uncertainty and the discomfort that it brings. And you're like, oh, that just, no, I, why? I, any any other thing in my life, yes, I will take it. I will take that doubt. I will take, but not this. 
why can't I just have it for this? Why can't I, I have a hundred percent certainty about this one thing? And since I don't even have certainty that my ceiling isn't going to collapse on me by the end of the show, how can I give you certainty that you're not going to, you know, molest 20 children and then run them over with your car? I just, I can't do it. I just can't do it. So then OCD might say, well, then go find a different therapist. Keep searching until someone promises you that this thing isn't going to happen. And the day you find somebody who promises you that, you have found a liar. And you don't want to hear that. I know. I know you don't want to hear that. But no one can guarantee 100% that something will or will not happen. And then OCD strikes back and says, well, that's not acceptable. And so we're going to keep searching until we find that. Parentheses. By the way, since my nickname is the doubting disorder, I'll never accept anybody who gives you an absolutely assured answer. And I'll always doubt it anyway, no matter what. Close parentheses. And there's where you're stuck. That's your life. Sound familiar to anybody? But why does it have to be this thought? Why can't it be that thought instead? Why does it have to be this one? Because that one's important to you, that's why. Hey, Dr. McGrath, I've got OCD about this thing, but I don't really care about it. Oh, okay, well, uh, that'll be $150. <laughs> no, that's not how it goes. It's, it's the worst case scenario. It's the catastrophe. It's the awful and the horrible. It's not the meh. It's not what it is. All right, now, I want you to think. I want you to think for a minute. Are you going to be able to go with the flow of whatever your thoughts are? You ever seen a willow tree? You know, like willow trees are awesome, right? They just, they flow in the breeze. And you got just that willow flowing all over the place. And I want you to think like that. I want you to just go with the flow of whatever those thoughts are, right? And just allow yourself to be with whatever it is that pops into your head. Wouldn't that be great if you could just do that? Oh, there's that thing. Okay. Oh, there's the oh, okay. <laughs> Instead of no, unacceptable. Leave now. Get out. Get out of my head, you. Not allowed. Not allowed. You must go. But of course, once we tell our brain that, our brain says, oh, that must mean you want me to stick around more. Okay. All right. I'll do that. I'll stick around. I'll be here for longer than, you know, don't think of, everybody knows what's coming. Don't think of a pink elephant. That's right. Don't think of a pink elephant, anyone. Have no pink elephant thoughts whatsoever. Okay. Don't think about a pink elephant. But you're thinking about it. You're absolutely thinking about it. And you know why you're thinking about it? Because I told you not to. So if you want to make sure that you think of something, try not to think of it. That's how you keep a thought in your head. Now. I want you to do something for me. I want you to take a couple of moments. I want you to think. If someone told you 
they have the thoughts that you have or the images that you have or the urges that you have. Would, would you tell them to do what you do or would you tell them to do what your therapist would tell you to do? Okay. I want you to think about that for a moment. Okay, everybody? Just think about that for a minute. Let's take a let's take a little 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 dance break for a minute. Think about that question. We'll come back to it. Oh, Paul, thank you once again for our theme song. We always appreciate that. Now, what did you decide? What did you decide? Would you tell someone to do what you do? Or would you tell them to do what your therapist tells you to do? And if you don't have a therapist, that typically means would you tell them to do the opposite of what you do? Because if what you were doing worked, you wouldn't have OCD anymore, right? But what you're doing isn't working, and that's why OCD just seems to get worse over time instead of better. So... It's almost paradoxical. If you want to get better, do the opposite of what you would normally do. Because that might be the best thing to do. All right, let's get back into some questions. I actually just uh, went down to the bottom here. I want to see some people. Uh, everyone says, I would not tell them to do what I do. All right. No. And some of you said, I would tell them to do what I do. Which, But then you said, unfortunately. Yes. Right. And you're right. Unfortunately. Right. And so even in that instance, there's the recognition that what I'm doing isn't working. Right. Natalie says, I would tell them they need to do ERP. Natalie, you're, Natalie will be coming on soon, by the way, everyone, as one of our, our guests. So we'll be excited to get that going. So that'll be great. And we'll talk a little bit to Natalie about her experiences. Teaching to the Choir says, Dr. McGrath, I always love watching your live videos because your humor of explaining all things OCD makes me laugh. Well, that's good. It's always enjoyable, plus you give such succinct, applicable advice. Well, 21 years of doing this, you get a little bit uh, succinct and applicable. So that's that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> Kristen says, how do I accept the presence of my intrusive thoughts and fears without accidentally convincing myself that they are true? <laughs> Kristen. Do you, as a child, ever accept that things like, you know, the Muppets and various other things, uh, maybe King Friday and Prince Tuesday and Henrietta Pussycat and Rex the Owl, maybe they were quite real things when you were a child. But as you, you got older, you uh, recognized that they weren't necessarily true. Might have felt that way as a kid, right? So I'm wondering, Kristen, right now, if you could accidentally convince yourself that Kermit the Frog is actually a real frog. Try it, Kristen. Try to convince yourself that Kermit is actually a real frog. 
who came out of the swamp, knowing how to play a banjo, ride a bicycle, and fell in love with a pig. Now, Kristen, when you can convince yourself that that is absolutely true and real, then maybe I will believe that you will also be able to convince yourself that your OCD is true and real as well. But until then, I fully believe you have the ability to recognize what is and what is not OCD. Hi, ho, Kermit the Frog here. You know, we could we could do that all day, right? We could play that and play voices and all sorts of things if we if we want to. <laughs> but does it make something real? Nick says, what's the strategy for dealing with scary, intrusive urges? They can be really hard to sit with sometimes. You feel like you're going to do something. Everyone noticing a theme tonight of a fear of what if I were to do something or it feels like you're going to do something? Maybe we do a test. Make a fist, everybody. You too, Willow. I have a little friend out there watching tonight named Willow. Hello, Willow. I went, Willow, make a fist. Now, I want all of you to think about popping yourself right in the eye. <laughs> and even give your fist a good look right in, the, right in that eye right there. Keep thinking about it. Have the image of yourself doing it. Feel the urge to even do it. Why didn't it happen? Why didn't I punch myself in the eye? I had the thought. I had the image. I even had the urge. Why, why didn't I do it? I didn't do any rituals. I, I didn't do any internal mental rituals. I wasn't holding this hand back with this hand or anything like that. It was right, right there. Uh, so what I need to know, and maybe if you feel like writing it in, I'd, I'd love to get your opinions. Though I had the thought and the image and the urge of punching myself in the face, and I asked you to do it as well too, why didn't it happen? Why didn't it occur? It, according, according to OCD, it, it should have happened. I had the trifecta of awfulness. I had the thoughts, the images, and the urges, right? So why, why didn't it happen? And the, the answer might be, I didn't want to, or, well, I did slightly just to see if I would do it because I wanted to test myself and you know, <laughs> those kinds of things. <laughs> There's always one that does that. Oh, and there is one. There is one. I, I see that. <laughs> but Adam says, only your actions can make it happen. Thank you, Adam. And Nina, I like what you said. Because my mind told me I had to, I felt discomfort. Now, there we go. Nina, thank you. Let's talk about discomfort, everybody, for a little bit, right? And, and there's this notion that I should not be uncomfortable. Nothing should make me uncomfortable. I should not feel discomfort. 
all of my life should be absolutely comfortable at all times. There should be no discomfort whatsoever. Well, the moment that's what you want, the moment that's what you want, all your brain is going to look for is things that are uncomfortable. Just going to just be searching all over the place for, all right, I want constant comfort. Now let me go find where I'm uncomfortable so that I can fix it. So where am I uncomfortable? Where am I uncomfortable? What's uncomfortable now? Oh, okay. Uh, no, no, okay. Oh, that, oh, ah, that's horrible. All right. I just came up with 743 things that make me uncomfortable. Now I've got to go work on those. Now, do, do any of you, do any of you know anyone who is 100% comfortable at all times. And this is me just says, I'm comfortable alone in my room, which is why I stay here. Yeah. And then, but I'm going to bet this is me, that that's not where you really want to be. And that that sense of comfort is soothing the OCD, but isn't a fulfilling level of comfort that you want for the rest of your life. So what's wrong with being uncomfortable? Right? And this is me says, you're right. Thank you. This is me. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. This is me. I'm going to use your example for a minute. I hope you don't mind. But, um, This is me says, being uncomfortable gives me loads of anxiety, right? And this is me, the only way to overcome that discomfort is to learn how to handle that anxiety. And how does one learn how to handle that anxiety? By leaving the comfort of your room and allowing yourself to learn that you can actually handle that. Now, this is me, you have a guarantee of being uncomfortable for the rest of your life by staying in your room. That is a guaranteed uncomfortable about everything for the rest of your life, even though you feel comfortable in the moment, which sounds kind of weird. I understand. But this is me. You have to make some decisions here, which is what's better for you? Being Trying to be as comfortable now as you possibly can, even though that makes you uncomfortable at everything for the rest of your life, so you only live in your room because you've decided that's the only place where everything's okay, or... This is me. Do you decide that I got to leave here? And boy, it's going to suck for a while. It's going to feel real crappy. That's for sure. But there's a chance. There's a chance to feel better by learning how to handle that discomfort. I can't give you the guarantee. Again, I wish I could. I wish I could promise that. But I can't give you that guarantee. I can give you one guarantee. And that, that's the only one that I know how to do, which is the more you stay in that room, the worse you're going to feel over time. And I like what this is me said. I need to venture out and suck it up. Yep. And Matthew says, baby steps. This is me. Yep. I don't need to throw you guys in the deep end of the pool, but I'd like you to open the door and take a look at the pool. Right? Now, Savannah says, I get really emotionally drained when I do this. Is that a normal response? And does that mean I'm overdoing it? Um, you know, Savannah, my, I... I get a lot of people who say they feel very emotionally drained because they start facing their fears. I mean, remember this, the fight, flight, or freeze response is designed to do one thing. And, as, and, and that one thing is get you the heck out of there. <laughs> That's what that one thing is. It's, it's designed just to get you the heck out of there. Run, fight, freeze, something. Get the heck out of here. And when you don't do that, you've got your own brain fighting against you, right? And some of you have heard this example, but I'll say it again. It's like one of my favorite books in the world, which is, it's a Sesame Street book. And then that book is, there's a monster at the end of this book. 
and you open up the first page and there's Grover and he says, oh, hi, uh, good to see you. Uh, please don't turn the page because there's a monster at the end of the book. And then you turn the page and he goes, ah, why'd you do that? There's a monster at the end of the book. And then you see a lock on the page that's drawn on there. And then you turn the page. He goes, ah, why did you do that? There's a monster at the end of the book. And then there's a lock and, and a couple of nails and everything. And by the time you get to the second last page, it's like the uh, Les Miserables uh, barricade trying to keep you from opening the page. And you turn the page and there's Grover. And it's Grover saying, oh, it was me. <laughs> I was the furry little monster. What do you know? And you know how much of people's life with OCD is like that? You have built something up in your head that is almost always so much worse than any actual event would ever actually be. And you then believe it to be true. This is me said, if I don't meet people, that's less people I'll lose. And if you don't meet people, you've lost everybody already. Is your fear losing people or being alone? Because you've already created being alone. And if the fear is losing people, yeah, it sucks, right? Nobody really wants to lose anybody. Nobody probably wakes up and thinks, well, hopefully I'll lose about four friends today. That'd be cool. This is me says I'm afraid of people dying. Okay. I'm going to get personal with you. This is me. So according to you, I shouldn't have gotten married. because my wife has a terminal cancer diagnosis. She's gonna die. So I guess I'd have been better off without having had her in my life, if that's the case. Or, I've had her in my life. I've had good experiences with her. Now it's rough. Not gonna lie, it sucks, right? But would it have been better to never have had that at all? And never had anything? I suppose people could argue that. I suppose there could be some merit in that whole argument about it. However, I don't know. This is me says, but she's going to leave you all alone in this crazy world. Well, before we got married, I was also alone. After she's gone, I'll be alone again. And I'll, I'll survive. I'll adjust. No. I'll figure it out. I don't have to like it. It's not going to be easy. There'll be some adjustment. But I'll figure it out. And I'll rely on other friends to help me get through the experience, right? And then eventually I'll lose them or they'll lose me. Something could happen to me tomorrow. Who knows? You might all lose me this week. I don't know. I don't know that I'll be alive next week. Hopefully, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know for sure. but I'm also not going to spend the rest of my week thinking, oh my gosh, what if I can't do the webinar next week? Cause I'm dead. How could I deprive everyone of my fun and exciting banter and humor? 
That'd be horrible. <laughs> and this is me. He says, don't say that. It's terrifying. But here's the thing. This is me. It's not terrifying to me at all. I, I could talk about dying and not be terrified at all. If it happens, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm not afraid of it. Now, maybe if given the opportunity in the midst of my death, be like, would you rather live or die? I'd probably say, yeah, I'll take the living thing. You know, that, that's great. But I, I'm also not going to spend my time worrying about when I'm going to be six feet below my tombstone instead as uh, as as a quote from one of my favorite movies ever I'm going to get busy living and not get busy dying so Natalie says, how do I come to not fear death? I'm really stuck on that one. Natalie, what is there to fear? And you might say, well, I won't be there for my daughter anymore, or my husband, or my parents will miss me, or there's so much more I want to do, and... All, all of those things are true and correct, yes. But you say the unknown. Tomorrow's unknown. Natalie, how afraid of you are of tomorrow are you? Natalie, are you sure that there won't be a meteorite that will strike the earth tomorrow? Or an accidental nuclear launch tomorrow? All of that's unknown, Natalie. How much do you need to fear those things? This is me says there's a fear of losing your parents. If that happens, I won't make it. I don't understand how people do. Well, this is me. Why don't you ask people who have lost their parents how they make it so that you can start to understand instead of try to figure or just assume, I should say, that you won't be able to function or handle it. Learn from people who have already had the experience about how they got through it. Rely on the wisdom and experience of other people. That's what I think you should do. Instead of making an assumption, which is, there's no way I'll be able to handle something that I've never handled before. This is one spot where good education might be very helpful. <laughs> right. Andrea says, how do you get past OCD with no support? Andrea, if you mean support from friends or support from family or support from therapy, um, if it's support from therapy, can you find a therapist? No CD available all over the place. Download the No CD app. Google Play, iOS, reach out to us at nocd.com. We're going to we'll be there to try to help you as much as we possibly can. You don't have to do this alone. And Johnny says, I can't do ERP. Is there another way that I can get over this obnoxious OCD? Uh, uh, Johnny, I don't agree with you that you can't do ERP. I just... I just don't agree with that statement, just so you know. I, 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 the word can't doesn't apply in these situations. So um, you, you can. Why won't you becomes, becomes the question. Matthew said, I knew that was coming. Well, thank you, Matthew. You've watched enough of my webinars to know how I take a look at some of these things. Finally, Nina says, uh, can you explain what Tourette's OCD is? Is it just like, just right OCD? Because I feel like I can relate with both. Tourette's OCD would be, um, 
my compulsions take on a tick like response, right? So I do certain bodily movements or something like that um, in order to uh, kind of neutralize something. So there's a great article that's on the IOCDF website by Charlie Mansueto if you want to read up on Tourettic OCD. So check that out. Andre also says, I can't do ERP. I, I again, I disagree completely, I will just say, personally. I haven't yet in 21 years met somebody who can't do ERP, but I have sure met people who won't do ERP. We see that all of the time. Well, everyone, It's been a joy. Always good to be with you on these wonderful Wednesday evenings. Next week, we're going to have with us Margaret Sisson. She was going to be here tonight, but something came up. So Margaret will be with us next week. Margaret is the founder of Riley's Wish. Riley's Wish is a foundation dedicated to helping people who have OCD and substance use. So we'll have her on. She's going to tell us the story about her son, Riley, and what he went through. And I thank you all for joining us tonight. And let's continue these conversations and questions and answers next week. We look forward to seeing you then. Be well, everyone. And hey, Willow, go to bed. Time for you to go to sleep. Good night, everyone.